a message to the soldiers in the Ukraine. The politicians, the media, our friends and family. Our pain is intense and relentless. We live in a hell beyond hell. The shooting down of a Malaysian passenger plane has sent a shockwave around the world. No one deserves what we are going through, not even the people who shot our whole family out of the sky. The images of these beautiful young faces captured the utter senselessness of the taking of innocent lives. I think the world reflected on MH17 through the eyes of the Maslin children. Our world as we knew it was absolutely over in that moment and we started to just say when the world ended and that's how we refer to it now. They didn't want to be here for those first few years. But they want people to see now that, look, you can overcome. It's amazing how courageous they were and still are. We stayed in this place right on the corner over there. The kids, one year, we rented that corner one. We are coming up to five years since the cataclysm. I think this is one of the most beautiful canals there is, this little one. This is awesome. The whole of Australia cared about us. I got one wave. Oh, uh, did you? Evie used to get waves from, yeah. from the big boats. Yeah, she'd wave at everyone on the boat and say who waved back. Where we were was hell. Where we are now is a different place. And what we feel we owe to the Australian public is to let you know how we got to where we are now. We're just ordinary people that something extraordinarily bad happened to. And we've tried to live our lives as best as we can since then, and we've done a really good job of it. And we're really proud of what we've managed to achieve in, in the time since. Sorry we couldn't see you this year, but we wish you were here. <laughs> we hope you can, we can see you next year. I wonder if it's good in... Um, Norway. Norway. Everything we really do is about the kids being proud of us and the kids looking down from where they are and saying, go, Mum and Dad, that's awesome. Talking about the kids is fantastic. We love to hear memories about our kids because it keeps them alive. Otis Samuel Frederick Maslin is just a joy bringer. He's a little rascal and a little bundle of, of fun and humour. <laughs> he loved all weird stuff. <laughs> and he was just so in tune with nature. Evie, Coco and Maslin, very, very much a caring and compassionate natured girl. I'm going to make a coin come out of Mo's ear. She was always so soulful and so kind to everybody around her. Two, three. Ta-da! Whoa! Mo Robert Anderson Maslin is wise, hilarious, loving, compassionate, peaceful. He always used to say, peace out. I really miss you. Zotus, he's still weird. It's even she's even weirder. <laughs> Mo's proper cool. He's just someone who puts everyone around him at ease. And he's just so off the charts, ridiculously intelligent.
Our kids were absolutely Scarborough kids. They loved the community around here. They loved the beach. They loved surfing, skating. Skating. OK, we've got Otis flying flat on his back, kicking hard. I grew up in Scarborough. I never moved. I met Rin in my backyard. We had our three children and then we got married. And my friend used to laugh, she said, um, oh, most people have three children and get divorced and you guys had three children and you're getting married. Thank you. You're a bit early, aren't you? The Maslin household is very unique and wonderful. Always so full of life. Now, Odie. And it was always fun and creative and, you know, slightly different. <laughs> they were all about family, their kids. And the love was evident. <laughs> and that radiated out to the whole community, wherever they were in the world. Maz and Rin have always been citizens of the world. I was stockbroking till I was 30. Then I was a founding MD of the first listed solar energy company in Australia. Rin and I put in the world's first solar-powered water bottling plant in a remote Muslim community in the Maldives. In 2010, we lived in Hong Kong for two years. It's made them very open and, and accepting of, of other people and um, different ways of life. We went back to Amsterdam a fair bit because of Maz's work associations. And um, Amsterdam has always been special to us as a family. Hi, I'm Otis. This is me. We're reporting from Amsterdam. And here is Evie to give you the weather. This is the weather in Amsterdam. And it's been so cold. Maz and Rin had been on holidays and Nick and the kids joined them over there in Amsterdam. Nick uh, loved spending time with his grandchildren. And uh, I think teaching the kids, the grandkids, to, uh, to think for themselves. Nick was a headmaster and, uh, and then went out into education consulting. It was great to be there with Dad to show him some of the places that we loved. The plan for Nick was to bring the children home to Perth for the start of term and to allow Rin and Maz to spend a little bit more time in Amsterdam. And that was the fateful decision. We walked them down to the taxi rank and we waved goodbye and we said, you know, we'll see you in a couple of days. Maz and I went to an art gallery and we rode around a little bit and we went to a cafe in the park. And uh, I remember saying to Rin, you know the last couple of weeks have been phenomenal and it just doesn't get any better than this. up in the middle of the night and I went downstairs and my phone was ringing. And it was my assistant, Jodie, and um, Jodie was saying, tell me your kids weren't on that plane. Tell me your kids weren't on that plane. And I was like, Jodie, stop, settle down, tell me what you're talking about. She was M817, M817. I looked it up and I saw their booking was MH17 and then I Googled. All I woke up to was Maz shouting and I didn't 
believe it. I didn't... I didn't believe it for a long time. A plume of smoke rising into the sky in eastern Ukraine. Local people here saying it was a plane which had just crashed. And the windows were open. And I just wanted to die. And she wanted to die. And we took it in turns at saying, I'm going to jump. What stopped me in that moment was I couldn't inflict the pain that I was feeling on anyone else. It's so blurry, but basically we ended up in a plane just literally just writhing in agony, flying home to Perth. We took the family to the apartment. We walked them inside and then... <sighs> Life as we knew it was never the same. On the 17th of July 2014, MH17, a Malaysian aircraft, took off full of passengers and crew and over eastern Ukraine, disaster. The plane had gone down. Close to the Russian border, a troubled region becomes a scene of utter devastation. There was a civil war raging in Ukraine that was territory occupied by the so-called Ukrainian rebels, the Russian-backed rebels. They wouldn't allow any international teams in to collect the remains and the possessions and start putting together the evidence as to what actually occurred. The site is controlled by the Russian separatists suspected of shooting down the plane. International observers are still being restricted. As our then Foreign Minister Julie Bishop was, was trying to get action in the United Nations, there was a growing sense throughout the world of outrage. It is in Russia's power to call off the separatists so that we have access to the site. I arranged a meeting with the Russian ambassador to the United Nations. I had on the table all of the newspapers from Australia and they had photographs of the Maslin children. And I said, you're a father. How could you possibly deny these children and their families justice? He began to cry, which surprised me. One of Julie Bishop's great successes was actually getting the Russians to agree, yes, we will allow you access to this area. In terms of what was on the news, I didn't care. What else are they going to find? What else are they going to see that matters to me? Because my children don't live in their bodies anymore. They live in our hearts. They'd already told us about Mo and they'd already told us about Odie. When the Australian Federal Police came to tell us that they'd found Evie, it was just like your spirit had broken. Someone said they were so close, they were meant to be together. And having Nick, the wisest man we know, with them as their eternal guide, gives us some comfort too. It was the size of the tragedy that happened to one family. I think that's what really shook all of us. When their innocent bodies were shot out of the sky, I was... <laughs> I stretched 
my arms as high as I could and screamed for them. I've never had so much admiration for grieving parents as I did for the Maslins that day. When we first got back, Maz and I knew that we couldn't be alone. Some friends knew that they had to get something started to look after Maz and Rin 24 hours a day because we were all so worried. And they came up with this idea for the web of love. It spread like wildfire. Emails went out and then uh, a schedule began. And right from the first few days, it was around the clock monitoring. We had a meal roster, so they didn't have to think about what they were eating. Everyone just wanted to help them because they had helped so many people over the course of their lives. Life with three kids was so full. So when the world ended, it's like, there's, there's nothing to do. There's just nothing to do. We'd sit down on the balcony and we'd watch the sunset. It was therapy, almost, being able to have a group of people there sharing the grief and helping each other. It was a huge adjustment being told, the only person you have to look after now is you. That was really very strange for me. I don't know, I love it down here. We found that we had post-traumatic stress disorder and to manage that, we organised our life really carefully and made sure that we stuck to our routines. We exercise, we, we go for walks outside. We sleep eight hours a night. We drink, but we don't drink too much because drinking too much causes you pain. Not drinking at all, <laughs> I personally find also causes you pain. But, <laughs> so it's a matter of getting that balance right in a, in a whole range of different things. We try to stay present and um, have small goals throughout the day. And we also try to manage our thoughts. If we were having particularly bad days, we, we just said, let's just go back to basics. Because all we need to do is just get through to the end of the day. If you can really focus on those moments when you walk outside and you can hear a bird singing and you just think, oh, that is a moment of, of peace. There is nothing actually wrong with this moment. Being focused on the now is really useful to dealing with, with grief and anxiety. Dutch investigators have confirmed what the world already knew. A Russian surface-to-air missile shot down Malaysia Airlines flight MH17. A little more than a year after the disaster, the Dutch Safety Board did release its findings uh, and they said MH17 was shot down by a book missile. The final report of the joint investigation team found that the book missile had come from the Russian Army's 53rd Brigade and tracked its journey from Russia into Ukraine, the moment it shot down the plane, and then back into Russia. They'd meant to get a Ukrainian military aircraft in the area. Instead, accidentally, they shot down MH17. Russia has denied any involvement. We're doing all we can to get Russia to admit liability and to pay compensation. We owe the families nothing less than to continue to fight for justice. When I heard that the Dutch Safety Board had evidence that it was Russian, I was not surprised and it didn't change anything. It didn't actually bring the kids back. I want to stay away from, from anger and, and blame. I don't particularly want to come face to face with Putin. If I did, then I would need to find it 
in my heart. <sighs> to forgive him. Anger doesn't help anything. I don't feel anger towards the people who fired the rocket. I feel something much worse. I feel pity towards them because they have to live the rest of their lives knowing that they've killed 298 people, including a phenomenal man and three of the most beautiful children to ever walk the earth. They did that. Do you choose to be tormented by their loss and absence? Or do you choose to surround yourself with their presence and speak to them and ask them questions? Rin and Maz had to find meaning in life again. And I think that's what they're working really hard to achieve. The emotions are so enormous. Doing artwork, I find that I'm able to express things that I can't necessarily just say. I work in collage, and that shows the layers of not just loss, but the layers of our life. This particular day, I said to the kids, what, what am I going to do? And I just felt like they said, like it was Mo who said, Mum, go to the art space. I was always doing my artwork on the kitchen table, so it wasn't really uh, working. And we decided to rent a little property in Scarborough, so I would have a studio space. After the world ended, another friend said, look, does anyone want to give a hand to help start up the art space in Scarborough? And then it was all hands on deck. Everyone walked up with paint brushes and tools and the whole place got a, a makeover. Before we know it, we're having exhibitions, there's classes, it's getting booked out. Yeah, so pick your yarn that you chose to do that with. And it's up to you how long or short you want to make them. We run workshops as well. It's just about getting people engaged with art. That's the whole purpose of the space. That looks That's magnificent. <laughs> it's been very healing. And though it was very much a project for Rin to focus on, it also was something for us as a community to focus on who were involved as well. I was back in Amsterdam and basically I was looking for some meaning, some reason to be here. And what I've worked out is the only way to get that is by helping people or helping the environment. Maz went to see a work colleague that he'd worked with in the past in Amsterdam and Maz, through this conversation, got the idea of restoring agriculture in the wheat belt. The wheat belt, in terms of its communities, most of them are dying. The people are, are leaving, the towns are closing, and the environmental degradation is terrible. We're trying to build a new food and farming system because we think the old one's broken. What we're trying to do is reverse that. We're trying to bring some new hope and new inspiration back to the towns by bringing new people back here. Wide open agriculture's wanting to regenerate ecosystems and communities. And to do that, you need people, and for people, you need jobs. And the thing that provides more jobs than anything else is uh, intensive horticulture. When you come up with a crazy idea, like putting a shade house in the middle of a wheat paddock in the middle of nowhere, the idea was to set up a pilot and make lots of mistakes. And uh, we've done that. We produced over 26 different varieties of vegetables in an area and a climate that no one had ever grown vegetables before. Well, yeah, just the amount of coming out of the ground. We own and manage farms, and we also bring that food all the way through to market under our food brand. Yeah, as soon as they took me down here, I went, yeah, we need to come back. 
It's definitely the prettiest spot you'll <laughs> ever see in the week. Yeah. Wide open agriculture for me is just honouring my kids. I'm just trying to do something positive. I'm trying to live my life in a positive manner because it's the only choice that I have. Within our layers of loss, there is also the loss of a lot of friends, actually, friends who've run a mile from us because they can't handle it for whatever reason. Potentially, people don't know how to react in situations. Asking questions actually helps that. Like Maz and I sort of started to get this, this look. It was just this pity constantly. And um, we sort of thought, we can't actually live our lives with, with that expression on people's faces at all times. Like, this needs to end. In fact, it's the thing that we're most allergic to is when people go, I just can't understand how you get out of bed in the morning. It's like, oh, wow, yeah, you're right. I shouldn't have got out of bed in the morning. I can only get out of bed because I'm a heartless, soulless prick. As an alternative, you sort of... Good on you for getting out of bed this morning. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, look at you. Turn it and make great. it positive. Yeah. I really do understand that people are empathising and that they're trying to be kind. Yeah, it's just, just anything that's positive, really. For us, we, we would rather people go, wow, look at how you get through each day. You're amazing that you go through each day. It's just a different way of saying it and it's a different way of actually looking at it. We love hearing all stories and, and talking about them is good. Washed up on the beach. That's a cracker. Yeah. It might be draining and painful, but it's good and it's positive. Dad tickling ID. Yeah, nice. We started to think about the possibility of having another child quite soon after the world ended because it was a tiny little glimmer of hope that our life might not be continuously and forever just loss. Yeah, gorgeous. So beautiful. So when I found out I was pregnant, I was obviously happy but also worried because I'd, I'd known how to parent three children, but parenting one little one who would live in the shadow of this tragedy was a pretty daunting task. Violet was born three days after Mo's 14th birthday and four days before Evie's 12th birthday. When she was born was just amazing. And it still is. She's awesome. Oh, big one. <laughs> Not much there. Up you go, Violet. Oh, dear. I'll never forget holding her in my arms and feeling just a tiny little moment of peace that I hadn't felt for so long. It was just like, oh, wow, a little bit of peace has come into my life. And down the curly slide. Ooh. Oh. I think the community at large felt like they could breathe again because it was like, now there's definitely a bit of happiness in their lives. She's a little bit of all of the kids, but she's her own person and she's a real little force of nature herself. Oh, this is the best one ever. And each night I tell her that I love her just as much as her brothers and her sister and that they all love her too. Nice. Come on, Violet. Relationship-wise, Maz and I are still together. Yay! <laughs> um, <laughs> we know that we can't actually separate because that would just cause us more pain and we choose no more pain. What do you think? Better sunshine? <sighs> there were fights. When you've got two people that they're both grieving, you're going to grieve at different levels. But they were at learning to deal with their own grief and learning to respect the other person's grief. Ducks, good girl, hook so. As a couple, they're phenomenal. You know, this incredible, unbreakable bond. We choose to think and act positively whenever we can. 
The best example of that is focusing on what you have, not on what you've lost. That's lovely, the sunshine, isn't it? I just want to show people that if they can survive what they've survived, other people can also survive what they're going through. And don't, don't give up. We are so lucky that Mo, Evie and Otis were part of our lives and came into our world to teach us so many things. And we're so lucky that we have Violet, that they sent her to us to allow us to be parents again, to give us hope and joy. I'm the father of four beautiful children. And that's a lucky guy in anyone's language. Now, you might not be able to see three of them, but it doesn't mean they're not here. So, yeah, they're here, right? Mm -hmm.